Well, greetings from York, Pennsylvania, uh, our nation's first capital. Uh, I'd like to say just a couple of words to the previous speaker. Doug, are you here? Well, anyway, he and our simpatico, I had to take that line out about the naming of federal legislation out of my talk. And Jason, uh, thanks a lot. I have to follow that entertaining show. Anyway, I can't tell you how excited I am uh, to be participating in the FMA conference and in the free market movement. Uh, thank you, Keith and Jay, for your innovation and your vision that sparked uh, this revolution. Uh, thank you also to Meg and the uh, rest of the FMA leadership for inviting me to come and tell the story of how we were inspired and how we were bringing a medical free market to uh, South Central Pennsylvania. My interest in healthcare reform and medical free markets grew out of my involvement in the political grassroots liberty movement. It quickly became evident to me that the Patient Protection and Affordability Care Act was going to make healthcare more expensive and lower quality. That's where I was going to put the line in about naming a federal legislation. I didn't think this just because of my general mistrust of big government, but more specifically, specifically because the ASA did not address the critical underlying drivers of unsustainable health care, third party payment, excessive and unwise regulation, and employer provision of, of, of health care. Instead, the a ACA just piled on more regulations, further third party payment, and didn't address the federal tax code. The ACA, only, the ACA only could make the situation worse, and that prediction has come to pass. True health care reform can only occur bottom up by the introduction of competitive forces. Many recognize the same, but were stymied waiting, waiting for the government to pass legislation, pass legislation that would promote um, medical free markets. Fortunately, Keith Smith and the Surgery Center at Oklahoma were not waiting for the government to the act. They made the bold move of posting transparent bundle prices and they catalyzed this mighty private sector reform movement. I learned a lot listening to last year's talk at the FMA conference, particularly from Mike O'Neill of Blue Book, Healthcare Blue Book and his analysis of the status quo healthcare market. Forgive me for retelling his information, but it, it's, it's instrumental to the vision that we have for implementing free market reform in Pennsylvania. He described that in any given market, the price of a particular service can vary by as much as a factor of seven. And, deeping, and, and diving deeper into that expense in its component parts, the physician component and the facility component, all of the differential is in the facility component with the large healthcare system, most of them nonprofits, charging the most. After his talk, a light, a light bulb went off for me. I saw that the previously mentioned healthcare drivers, third, par third party payment, excessive regulation, federal tax policy, spawned the status quo quality and cost opaque market, and it's controlled by the behemoth. Uh, health care providers and insurance companies. Understanding this dynamics creates opportunities. It is an opportunity for, for self-funded employers and other entities that buy their own health care to get more value for their expenditure, better quality and lower cost. It is an opportunity for independent-minded providers to dump the status quo market controlled by the big players and to compete on value. It is an opportunity for enterprising TPAs and healthcare benefit consultants to bring more value to their clients by developing products that lets them access the, the, a medical free market. A final background component to our initiative in Pennsylvania, the vibrant free market that we find here in Oklahoma City developed organically from a first cause. That first cause was the posting of transparent bundled pricing. Employers and others who pay their own bill noted that value but didn't have a good way to access it. And so in stepped the Kempton Group and they provided their bolt-on that allowed the employers to access that value in the market. That was the first step and then more 
sellers came to the market looking for the opportunity to compete on value, and more buyers came to, into the market to get the value. And it was increasingly more value as there was a broader array of services offered, and competition sharpened the pricing. So returning to our plan in uh, Pennsylvania, it has two strategic components. Understanding the opportunities that transparency and quality and cost create. And secondly, having witnessed the evolution of the market in Oklahoma City, we hope to accelerate the development of the market in our region by not only posting bundled pricing, but additionally by concurrently promoting this free market vision to the three key players, the buyers, the sellers, and the value-adding facilitators. We began the implementation by contacting the veterans back here in Oklahoma. We picked their brains and we learned from their experience. Their advice given over many conversations has been invaluable, and thank you very much. We also reached out to uh, healthcare Healthcare Blue Book and Empirica to get a better understanding of pricing and quality. Next, we began laying out the free market vision to our independent minded colleagues. Our goal is from the beginning to bring in as many services to the market as possible so as to maximize the value enhancement for potential buyers. And I'll return to that in just a minute. In South Central Pennsylvania, we live in the shadow of four gargantuan nonprofit systems. They own prim primary care, they own specialty care in multiple imaging and surgery centers, and they have strong and symbiotic ties with the, the large payers. Explaining to my colleagues that free market medicine would change the field of competition for delivering care from who's the biggest to who's the best and does it at the best cost is a compelling line of reasoning. We had several meetings to explain the vision, how it works at an operational level, how to come up with bundled pricing, and to address the concern that this was not a race to the bottom. Jay Kempton was good enough to fly out and, att and attend one of our evening meetings and to tell us about the Oklahoma experience and to answer questions. I only later found out that he actually did it in his sleep because he left Oklahoma that morning at 2 in the morning. But nonetheless, he did a pretty good job. Thanks again, Jay. At this time, our market sellers include a GI group, a surgery center that provides general surgery, urology and ENT services. Rebecca Bruce is here, and she's the, v she's the vice president of Leader Surgical. Um, our orthopedic group has services that includes imaging, physical therapy, infusion, and outpatient and inpatient surgery. A local benefits consultant estimates that our combined services likely approaches 30% of the, the, the expenditure of a large self-funded employer. Additional healthcare sellers that we have interested but have not yet taken the plunge include plastics, gynecology, ophthalmology, and a dialysis center. Concurrently, as we were talking to my physician colleagues, we made contacts and have had conversations with TPAs and benefit consultants. My first call was to Chris Bailey, another member of the PA uh, FMMA. Um, the sell to these folks was easy as well, an opportunity for them to bring to their self-funded clients a potential of 40% or more reduction on 30% of their medical spend is very attractive. One early on engaged TPA, AIA, or actually a benefit consultant, came to us and told us that they had found a partner, the Zero Card, to implement a free market business plan. If you don't know, the Zero Card is a Kempton Bolton-like product with a cat's ear name, right? The, the marketing thing, Jay, the marketing. Initially, the, the Zero Card actually begged off but learning the breadth of services that we were offering convinced them it was worth the investment to come to our region. Uh, excuse me, to come to our region. We also talked to CoreSource, uh, an independent TPA. Initially, they were slow to engage, but seeing our progress and not wanting to be left out, they found a local benefit consultant, BDS, who committed to develop and administer a bolt-on product. As word has gotten out about our initiative. Interest in free market facilitating products has snowballed, and we have Kempton, the Zero Card, HealthSmart, BDS coming into the market. We're no longer calling brokers or consultants, they're, they're calling us. Once we had a number of sellers and several value adding facilitators committed, we then contacted our friends uh, and acquaintances in the business community. Strictly speaking, it's the benefit consultants 
uh, and the brokers who will do the actual selling. But our success as sellers of healthcare is intimately tied to their success in selling their market facilitating products. Leveraging our relationship in the community is a win, win, win. It's also an easy sell to the self-funded employers. They quickly recognize that medical free markets would bring more value to their healthcare spend. Typically, soon after we've had one of these conversations, we get a call from their benefit consultant or design person. A final component uh, of our effort to put on, uh, of our effort to introduce medical free markets is we're putting on a regional conference to introduce uh, met the medical free market vision. We've invited sellers, buyers, TPAs, benefit consultants, business groups, healthcare sh sharing ministries, gra grassroots activists, our state free uh, our state free market think tank, anyone who would like to see higher value care. Our conference is in Harrisburg on October 15th. You should come to Pennsylvania. It's beautiful in the fall. You can talk to Todd Kiefer, who is here, he, for more information on the conference. So uh, we haven't converted to cash yet, but the pieces seem to be falling into place. And we are optimistic that uh, at the start of the new benefit season on January 1st, we will rock the market, and it will never be the same. If I get invited back, I'll let you know how it worked out. In any case, I, I, I welcome the opportunity to have further conversations with you. You can contact me at Pennsylvania at fma.org or kpandelitis at osshealth.com or you can message me on the uh, event app. Thank you very much. That was really good. I'm going to have a tough time topping that. Um, Again, I want to thank Keith and uh, really everybody from Oklahoma Surgery Center here uh, to allow me to come back. This is my second year here, and um, I've been in practice 16 years, and, and I had seen Keith's article in a, in a journal back in 2007, and it kind of hit me. It's kind of an interesting concept, but where's it going to go with this? Is it really going to happen or not? Kept seeing him pop out every couple of years, and then finally 2011, I thought, all right, this is a concept i got to go with. Now, I want to give you a different spin on kind of how my practice got started on this. Um, 16 years ago, when I came in uh, and uh, opened my office, I immediately was uh, between two large hospital systems that, uh, if you know your ABCs and 123s, uh, CHS is not a great player um, in the market. Uh, they put a lot of people in bankruptcy because they charge too darn much. So if you're from CHS, you guys can come talk to me later. Um, but I sit between two hospitals and then really do a lot of work at a, a critical access hospital in addition to our own surgery center. But it was the, the two major conglomerates that were north and south of us that really allowed us to uh, place ourselves on the map. Um, within one year, I had a lot of workman's comp companies contacting us wanting to know if we would build our own surgery center. And that's really where we got started 15 years ago. Uh, it was a thing that we uh, started small and uh, built up from there to now about 70% of our practice is actually workman's comp. Well, as soon as I started seeing uh, the free market medical model, and especially when I bought into it last year, it's something I wanted to take this back to our work comp uh, providers to say, all right, you guys are large employers. How can we help you? And lo and behold, of course, they're all self-insured. As we all know, that 80% of these employers, more than 50, 50 employees, are self-insured that uh, they're going to have that model. Well, then you got to get in and find out about the brokers, the TPAs, whoever else is involved in that, uh, that section of that employer that's going to get you in the door then to pass this model off to them to save them some dollars, especially where I'm at in Missouri because of these two large hospital systems that are just uh, raping the, uh, the area. So when we built our facility, um, it was the only surgery center in the area. Uh, we still have the only one within 60 miles. So it's something that in our draw area, even though we're in a small rural area, our population uh, draws about a quarter million people. We work directly with the critical access hospital that's in town because I want to be able to support that. It's actually uh, where I grew up. I, I went back home and uh, first I thought, what the hell am I doing? This is a small town, but uh, lo and behold, it's turned out to be the best thing for me and my family. When I first started reading about FMA, I thought, all right, I, I got to call Dr. Smith and find out a little bit more about this. Well, he's the type of guy that anytime you call him, he's going to answer the phone, pick it up, and he's going to give you everything he can to help you out and get you going in this process. When we first looked at it, I said, all right, what are the pros to doing this? Well, cost savings, okay? You're going to be able to control your implant costs a little bit more. 
Um, the way we're able to do that, 95% of the implants that I use in orthopedics come directly from one company. So we're able to kind of hit them a little bit harder knowing that there's competitors out there that if they don't give us a good deal that we can pass on to our customers, then they could be out. And Keith told me uh, whenever he does a bid, he tells them all, one shot, one time, that's it. You don't make it, you're done, which that's a great concept. And we've really bought into that as well. No hidden cost, you're transparent. Um, you're able to put those costs right out there so anyone that's looking at our website can directly see those. The population uh, base that's gonna be able to, to look at this and take their own situation, their own uh, um, costs into this and, and take their outcomes personally that they wanna invest in a good product. You don't go buy a crappy car because that's what you wanna spend. You want the best that you can possibly afford. Some of these uh, players also have uh, financial incentives back to the patients as well, which I, I did not know that until last year, and I think that's a great option because in the end, it still saves the employers and the insurance company money. So when we started the work comp business, we're a full-line orthopedic practice with the exception of spine care. I don't do any spine surgery. I leave it up, up to guys like Nick here. Um, but we added, uh, through our allied health people, uh, occupational medicine services as well, so pre-employment physicals, drug testing, hearing tests, respirator fit testing, all these types of things that if you go to these employers and you can offer them everything that they need, they'll literally walk back in your door then for these self-insured type of uh, uh, patient uh, profiles. That has opened a lot of doors for us to the point where we've expanded now even outside of Missouri into Illinois, Iowa, and Nebraska, just because of where we strategically sit that allows us to expand that market even further. Well, the difficulties um, that we found with it, um, it took us a year truly to get this thing up off the ground. Um, I got a great management to crew and I brought all of them with me today. My marketing director, my business manager, my surgery director. Um, they do a fabulous job to keep me going so I can do what I was trained to do and love to do and that's just orthopedics. They take care of the marketing and the running of the business side of this. The difficulty we face right now is being in a rural area. We're in a small town but we have rail access. We're still within a couple of hours of two major airports and also a regional airport that we can get people in and out of. So far, we've seen people come in from uh, different areas of the country, uh, still more Midwest than anything else, but uh, we do have some uh, that are starting to come in from outlying areas, uh, Massachusetts uh, and uh, Louisiana, things like that. We also do not have a multi-specialty offering at this point, so we're still working on trying to develop that. Again, being a small area, as you can imagine, with two conglomerates next to us, most of those other docs are, sell, are uh, employed by the hospital systems and they have non-competes in place, which that can still be very difficult to get around those. But uh, those physicians are at least interested in it, so when they come back up for contract renewal, they try and renegotiate that back in there. It's not necessarily loss of revenue for the facility because, again, most of these patients are coming from outside the immediate local area. I personally uh, have some issues with the lack of follow-up care for some of the patients that come in. and. Goodness enough, we, we have some patients that do come back and see us within a month or two months just to do a follow-up care. I like that because personally, I wanna know if that patient's going out the door that they're gonna have exceptional follow-up and they're gonna do well. I don't wanna just be there just to fix it and that's it. So since we started this, well, what have we done? Well, number one, we decided we're sick of government, okay? I'm pro-Trump, Missouri, I'm pro-Eric Greitens. Okay? I wanna see some non-career politicians get in there and change healthcare. Okay, we've all wanted this for a long time. We finally now have an opportunity. I wanted to be part of the new wave in healthcare, and Keith convinced me that last year. I still remember walking through a facility, pulled me aside, he's like, take a look at this letter I got from Medicare. It's hanging up on my wall. You know, it, it's interesting. I, I, like, uh, I like that. I tell that story to a lot of people because Medicare contacted him because they wondered why he still wasn't working with them. We had to figure out our cost in this as well. So literally, um, I think for almost a week, uh, my surgery director and I sat down, we analyzed everything down to the four by four, to the drug vial, to everything we had at cost in there to truly figure out what our bottom line was. The other thing with being in a small area, I can also cut costs on anesthesia coverage. We use all CRNAs and not uh, anesthesiologists, not to knock them, but it's still more cost effective to us. We met with the vendors, discussed optimal pricing options with that as well to again, try and cut that down as much as possible, passing that cost savings back on to the patient and the employer as well. We partnered with a local extended care facility for anybody that's coming in for knee replacements. Obviously, we don't want to keep people in uh, um, more than 24 hours, so technically we do ours. Uh, they're there for three or four hours. They go on over um, by private vehicle to the extended care facility, stay two days in town, and then back home they go. 
We developed the uh, Missouri chapter for FMMA. We had to have a partner with that, and we partnered with Orsland Industries, which is a farm and home company that has uh, um, plants, manufacturing, um, all types of service and retail stores throughout Missouri and the Midwest. My marketing director had a lot to do with the website development. Again, if you don't reach the public, you're not gonna get your product out there. So development of the website, the pricing, videos that uh, I know Keith and I share videos back and forth a lot, which is great because uh, I love seeing his videos. I, I, I wish everybody could see those. Um, that's one of the good tools of Facebook. Webinars, um, and again, it's like real estate. Location, location, location. It's marketing, marketing, marketing for this. You got to get your name out there. At that point, we became a referral network uh, to providers to several of the TPAs and pricing agencies. Uh, we put an in-house pharmacy in as well, which in Missouri, you can't be a retail pharmacy, but you can certainly dispense to your own patients as well as all of our workers' comp patients as well, again, to save them money. And then, like I mentioned previously, the expansion of the uh, uh, licenses and uh, practice into the other states. So our facility does orthopedic care with the exception of spine, uh, podiatry. We do nerve studies through neurology, uh, GI, pain management. Um, I would still like to see that get uh, up to more of a full-service network in order to really provide the Midwest area where we're at uh, a better option. <clears throat> so I know you guys have seen probably Keith's website to know how a patient actually gets to you. Well, you got to get out there with some of these companies. We've partnered with Access HealthNet, Better Doctor, Christian Healthcare Ministries, Healthcare Blue Book, Health Smart, Host Care Resources, The Kempton Group, MD Save, Medibid, uh, Prater, Price MDs, and Pricing Healthcare. So, by getting in with the TPAs, uh, referral networks, things like that, the more you can get your name out there, provide your prices to them, they're going to start to bring patients to you. Obviously, give them a good result in the end, good optimal pricing as well. So, where are we going to take it from here? Well, it's up to us, it's up to you guys as well to get this word out to the public. Um, you got to get it to the TPAs. You got to want the government to change and actually less government. Let's all make a difference with this so that way that we can get a better access to health care and more cost effectiveness. You still have to provide the exceptional cost effective care with immediate access as well. I think that you also have to do this as a team approach, and I think the new wave in healthcare is going to be a single healthcare system, but under the free market medical model, that we all as one become a group that we can refer to each other back and forth, depending on if we're in Pennsylvania, in Missouri, Oklahoma. My practice needs to expand, again, the multi-specialty types of options as well. I think if we can improve the physician, surgeon facility exposure by the referral networks as well, they're selling their product, but they also have to sell us as well. And in the end, we're going to still provide the public with a better cost-saving uh, method. So thank you. I appreciate uh, any questions you may have for Nick or I. Do you want the box? Yeah. You're allowed to throw this thing, right? Oops, not into the water. So... Uh, I have a surgery center out in uh, Clearwater, Florida, and we've been doing the, the posting our prices online. I've been doing that for a few years now. Uh, in your discussions with the different third-party administrators and these different groups that are out there, um, have you found that they've come to you and asked for lower pricing specific to them comparable to what's on your website? Because I have groups saying, well, if your prices are online, what value do I get if I'm bringing you volume? And I feel like now I have TPAs that are acting as insurance companies who are treating the price as the product, which we all know is not what should be happening. How have you dealt with that? I've not really seen it too much, uh, but again, we've, we're fairly new to this system. Um, the only one that I've seen that we're truly, uh, quote unquote, bidding on is Medibid, where you're putting in a price uh, and they're comparing you to other locations across the country. They're still adding in there what's the cost of travel, lodging, you know, things that are going to be you know, tangible uh, to not just the health care costs uh, to coming to see us as well. But so far, we've not really had to negotiate much with that. I'm a firm believer in what was said at this conference previously which is any willing buyer. So you establish a price, and that price is either competitive in the market or, or it isn't. And they may want lower pricing, but if you are already below the market price, their option is only to go to somebody that, that is uh, going to charge them more. I find it interesting when patients bring me their EOBs, especially, like I mentioned, these two hospitals that sit next to me. And one of the things that killed one of the hospitals uh, about three years ago, uh, there was an article in one of the business tribunes 
that looked at five common procedures or hospital inpatient procedure type of activities uh, for, I think it was nine area hospitals. The average total price for a knee replacement at uh, one of the hospitals I used to work at um, was $127,000. And I can't imagine anybody would want to pay $127,000 if they're not in some type of a capped system. Um, anybody can go on most of our websites that are providing this type of service, and you're seeing anywhere between eighteen dollars and $24,000 probably for a knee replacement. I know I talked to someone earlier today that talked about bilaterals for uh, $28,000 versus the hospital EOB that they saw for $300 something. Um, the, the markups are just are crazy because, again, they're cost shifting, as we talked about earlier today, uh, to save other services. While I have the box, um, how do you handle the implants? I, I'm finding uh, when we originally started, we did the implants separately uh, with no cost markup. But again, I'm finding a lot of groups now wanting us to include the implants in our total bundled cost. And we're an orthopedic facility, so as an orthopedic surgeon, how do you uh, handle that? Well, when we looked at the pricing in the market, and interesting, we came at the price not from the cost side, but for what it cost, but what the price was in the market, we understood that we needed to be 40% or so less or, or more, really, th under the market price. And when we did our, our pricing and our costing, we included the implants in, in our price. Now, we have a pretty big practice. We probably do four, four or 500 joints a year, 600 spine surgeries, and we went to one vendor and we get pretty good pricing. So right now it's included in our, in our bundled price. Because you can control the cost if you know what it's gonna be. The only thing I would add to that is, I'm, I'm an arthroscopist, so you know, a shoulder is different from a shoulder. Um, if I'm repairing a single subscapularis tear with one anchor, that's a big difference in repairing three tendons on a double row, which I might put in seven anchors. And the price of those anchors from one to seven can vary you know, 500 bucks to $4,000. So depending on the situation, we have excluded our implants on there. It's on our website that states that, but we do give it to them at uh, the invoice cost on that. Um, but I think coming in, when we're reviewing MRIs ahead of time, I'm able to relay that to the patient or the, uh, the TPA or the beneficiary um, of this is a small cuff tear, this is a big one. ACLs are a lot easier to determine. Meniscus are a lot easier to determine. Total joints, obviously, are our fixed cap costs as well. But uh, shoulders are probably the biggest thing for me that uh, I cannot determine exactly that's, that's how many that's anchors. That's probably running into problems with, yeah. yeah. Keith. TPAs have come in and said, you know, we're going to bring you a lot of volume, and so lower your prices, give us a discount. It's actually a violation of one of our pillars. Uh, equality of pricing is one of the pillars because this volume discount stuff, I mean, that's part of, it's a huge part of how we got to this mess that we're in. So I think where that comes from, though, is a confusion on the part of the buyer many times. And I know that when we started to have direct carve-out relationships with some employers that were using Blue Cross to administer their self-funded plan, the comparison was made of our website pricing to the Blue Cross allowable fee schedule. And that's a mistake because that is not the source of the savings. It's not the difference between those two prices. It's the difference between the price at one of our facilities and what happens if they go to one of the price gouging so-called not-for-profit hospitals. So that delta is the is the genesis of the pricing uh, in the savings. So whenever I'm asked by someone, will you give me you know, some kind of a discount off your website pricing, is that the best you can do? I just say, you know, go find, go find a better price. And, and Nick is right. I mean, it's either, it's either a market clearing price or it's not. If they can uh, find a better value, then they ought to go for it. I think we've already discounted them down enough is bottom line at this point. And we don't, we don't include, uh, to the implants, we don't include implants in all of our pricing because we do a lot of, say, fractures, we do a lot of orthopedics, and, and you just don't know. However, one way around that is, if you don't know, is to quote the patient a range. And what we'll typically do is we'll know, worst case scenario, we're going to have to use a $1,200 titanium uh, plate for a clavicle fracture and we'll collect that $1,200 
and then refund them all that money as they go out the door if we use uh, $80 worth of hardware. So, or, or you can quote ranges. I mean, that, that's one way to get around that. Yeah, and I guess I should say that our, uh, our plan now is theoretical because it hasn't yet happened, although a lot of the, we don't, we do the shoulders, but our big volume is, is joints and spine, and that is a little bit more predictable, and we do enough volume that we come up with pretty good blended costs. Implant costs, you know, as we've all already discussed, can just vary so significantly. I have a famous case that uh, it's about six years ago that uh, um, is the exact same case, ankle fracture, same plate, number, same plate, same number of screws, same tightrope, same week, two different facilities, one at the Big Boy, one at the Critical Access Hospital. One price was 76000 the other one was 9600 <laughs> I mean, and the big boy got paid seventy-two thousand. That's absurd. Uh, that's just that's just not acceptable. Um, that does nothing besides just uh, put people in bankruptcy. Um, it causes a uh, cost just a trend uh, trending higher. Yeah, thank you, uh, Kevin Tadish, I'm orthopedic surgeon. Uh, I met you earlier, and we were. I have a very similar situation that you do. That our surgery centers between two big organizations, and um, what has happened to show the dirty pool that can go on is um, we had a transfer agreement with our partner who is an hour away from us. Um, the state was called to come in and audit us for no transfer agreement. We showed them a transfer agreement, which we operated under for six years, and we've been at, we had one transfer in that whole time, which was just a nonsense transfer. And we provide excellent health care with very minimal uh, you know, complications and no morbidities at all that way. And so anyway, uh, the state said, oh, this is a non-issue. But uh, Medicare came along and said, you, don't, you need to have a transfer agreement with that nearest hospital. And guess what? The hospital who doesn't like us doesn't want to give us the transfer agreement. And I'm wondering if you guys have had any similar situations because, you know, when you start going free market and you start competing, they don't like you. And they will look for any which way. And we've been fighting this ever since. And we've been able to maintain our center opening because we had to all be on staff at that hospital. But that means applying for credentials, being on call for them. I mean, they got you over barrel on this. And we're still fighting this. Um, I've heard recently that uh, this is a Federal Trade Commission violation. And it's starting to happen all around the country with surgery centers. And the Federal FTC is actually looking into this and um, awarding damages to surgery centers who these big systems are beating up on. And unfortunately, uh, if you haven't had those guys, you might. So uh, we're, we're kind of one of them. And uh, I'll let you know how we're solving it. We have actually FTCs looking at it right now, and we're hoping that this um, goes bye-bye real quickly. But uh, it's killed our, our ability to expand, and we've been kind of just staying neutral right now. We can't expand because no docs want to come in because they have to be on, on staff at this little hospital. Have anything such like that ever heard of these experiences or anything like it? For the time being, we still have a transfer agreement with the, uh, the big nonprofit uh, next door. We haven't really hurt them too much yet, but I do think there's, you mentioned the, uh, the Federal Trade Commission, but I also think, and I was having a conversation earlier with, with Tom Kelly, that a lot of the members of these nonprofit boards don't really know what's going on, but they're fairly influential. And I think, you know, if you tell them, well, look, this is what's been happening for the last 40 years. You know, you've had higher expenses, your, employ your employees have gotten lower wages, um, and now they're trying to stop something that's going to lower costs. So I do think there's probably a marketing angle and maybe there'll even be legal recourse. We have our center in uh, the small town where the critical access hospital is. So we've had a transfer agreement with them since we started, and we've had no issues. And I think in 12 years, we've transferred two people. Yeah, it's, it's such a small amount. Um, certainly the big players don't like me. I don't like them. Um, <laughs> but they've still tried to buy me out. And uh, I've said no. <laughs> uh, kiss my you-know-what. And uh, you know, I'm all for the patient and not for their almighty dollar. So uh, it's, uh, it's something that we deal with because, you know, they got, they got more funds than we do to, to gang up on at times, but uh, we've held our own at this point. I have the box. <laughs> I feel, the box I feel, speaks. I feel powerful in front of all these doctors. 
Uh, my name's David. I'm a professor of economics at Indiana University uh, Southeast. I'm, Go Hoosiers. Yeah, right? <laughs> so I was looking at both of your websites, and I may have a misconception about free market health care, but I saw that on both your websites you all still do insurance. Yes. And how do you keep your that bureaucracy and that cost out and not get into fights with insurance companies based on what you're doing? I have two surgery centers. I have one that is, uh, you know, because you're renting space. I have one that basically is a surgery center for the free market medical model and one that isn't because you're renting space. That's a legal way to get around it. Um, we basically uh, have direct contracts with certain people, uh, especially the workman's comp side, and then also through the free market medical model as well. Um, most of the commercial insurance and also the, the Medicare patients, I'm still taking to the local critical access hospital. I would like to get switched over to where it's basically 100% workman's comp and free market medical only, um, but that's going to take a little bit longer. So we would love to do the same, but we've been, you know, on, in, in the status quo market since our existence. Uh, we haven't really had any conflicts. Our, our, our disclaimer states, you know, very clearly, you know, for this price, you can't submit to insurance. We evaluate you. If you're appropriate for the surgery, we do the surgery. We invoice you, and we get paid within, you know, a, a short uh, time. It would be awesome if this grows, and I hope that it will grow, that as our capacity is reached, we just start getting rid of our most contentious third-party payers, and that that process continues to grow until it's just our free market business. But uh, thus far, we don't see any conflict. Well, follow up. I'm also a business owner, so every year I have to uh, renew my health insurance that I make available to my employees, and I have an insurance broker that goes and hunts for the four major providers in our area. It seems like to me that these insurance companies, if they saw your pricing and they knew what it was because it's so much less expensive. But part of the problem is, like in the Louisville metro area, the insurance companies and the hospitals are in cahoots with one another. So they kind of corner the market and they're boxing us small business guys out. In fact, there is an incentive for us to push them to the exchange because of the money that they would give us back as small business. I mean, how do you compete when those guys are working together? It, it's very hard if you're not self-funded. If you have a relatively high, a healthy population, you can have high deductible policies, and if people aren't likely to use a lot of that, that deductible in any given year, they'll be incentivized, and you can, incent you can write a benefit plan to incentivize them to go to the, the low-cost, uh, low high-quality high provider. The problem is that if for some reason they go over the deductible, you can't get any credit for that you know, with, with the primary payers. But for the self-funded it, it, uh, employers, I don't think the insurance, the insurance companies or the hospitals can do too much because the employer is paying the bill. And if they're saying they're looking at a potential bill of $25,000 for total hip replacement or $60,000, there's nothing that they're going to, the insurance company or the hospital can tell them you know, to make, to make them use their facilities. Right. So it, it's, I think it's an easier nut to crack with the self-funded em, 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 employers, but I do think, you know, that uh, people like Jay Kempton and other uh, forward-thinking uh, benefit designers are gonna, gonna make some progress on this because it's the next, it's the next step. I send them a sample copy of one of the EOBs from the big boys and they get scared. <laughs> Um, from, a, from a med student perspective, is there anything uh, we can do now to uh, prepare ourselves to have a cash-based practice and sort of avoid government involvement as much as we can in our future career? Keep coming to these meetings and ask a ton of questions. Um, anybody here as a physician, did you have a business course in med school? No, of course not. So unfortunately, the government has made it a point that we have to be business people in order to survive in healthcare. And that is something that I had a couple of attendings uh, during my residency long ago that they were excellent businessmen. So you, you ask the right questions first about, you know, what do you do with this ACL? What do you do with this rotator? Hey, by the way, what about this fund? You know, what about this? So you, you, uh, you, uh, you learn from uh, the people who are there before you. And right now with one of the local medical schools that I work with uh, the students uh, in the spring, 
Um, I finally had talked them into they do one week worth of business training and I give a couple lectures at that. So I, I think that you have to ask a lot of questions. You gotta read a little bit. So read six nights a week on your medical stuff and read one night a week on business. Okay? I'm sure Keith could probably put you in contact with a lot of uh, different articles. Talk to Jay um, on this model as well. But I think you have to take it upon yourself just like you do with your, your medical studies to learn about this. I just wanna comment on that too. I've taught medical students for years um, and as a, as a primary care physician, I spent a lot of time speaking to my third year medical students about business yep. for exactly the reason that we don't get any business training. And even a primary care doctor is basically running a half a million dollar company. Now they don't get to take that home just in case anyone is confused, but <laughs> you know, they're running that company. And um, so I was foolish enough in some of my rotations in residency specifically to be rotating with individual doctors who were out there in the community who were not academic physicians. They ran their own practices and I was foolish enough to ignore everything they said to me about their business. So don't make that same mistake. Ask questions not just about the heart valve or the surgery or what uh, medicine to use, but ask questions about overhead and full-time employees and those types of things. Let me just add one thing, if I might. I, I think for whatever reason, people think that the economics of healthcare is different than the economics of anything else. And because of perverse incentives created in the market, that is the case, but it ought not to be. You know, people, people act only in one way to the incentives that are established. So I, I think of having a foundational understanding of just economics and incentives um, helps you develop a business model uh, as, as we move to more free markets. I would agree with this gentleman here that you need to seek out your answers from people who are not employed physicians necessarily. Look at the pri private sector. Uh, fantastic conversation. I have two questions. The first is I love this concept of kind of two individual silos in your practice where one is the free market and the other is contracting with insurers. Do you work in a certifi uh, certificate of need state? And if so, is that an issue? Um, and the second question is that what we've run into is that, if, for instance, if a patient comes to me with a Blue Cross card and I'm a Blue Cross contracted provider, I'm legally ob or contractually obligated to accept and process their care through that Blue Cross card. How do you handle that, in, or is that in your contracts? And if so, how do you address it? Um, well, your first question, talking about the, the two silos there, I, I think that separating that out between the, again, most of what we do is workman's comp, okay, and then the free market medical, and then you have your commercial and government aside. Um, to follow up with that with your Blue Cross question, it all depends on what the contract states. We have some of the, the self-insureds that, uh, we've got a couple of plants that we take care of that are, are under Blue Cross as a, as, a, as a TPA, that that's what we would have to accept. Now, some of those end up at the hospital, some of them end up at our facility as well. Um, but my hope is to get to the point where it is even the, the self-insureds that are not necessarily with the BUCAs. I'd love to get away from the BUCAs completely and just deal with the, the primary secondary uh, TPAs. Because I think, again, you're putting ins insurance carriers back in the mix of this thing that is trying to run your business. That's, that's not what we want. So. In, in Pennsylvania, there isn't a certificate of need. But I had a conversation earlier, and I, I like to make the point. A certificate of need just shows how messed up our system is. Because of the third-party payment system, we have essentially uh, um, unlimited demand for health care. So anytime you bring more supply into the market where you have free market forces operating, it should drive competition, lower costs, and improve quality. But in healthcare, where you have this unlimited demand, it just means more expenditure. Um, it, if the person carrying the Blue Cross card, uh, if, if Blue Cross is just the TPA and not the, not the organization mm -hmm. taking on the healthcare premium risk, then, you know, that that self-funded employer could get a product like the Kempton Bolton that would incentivize their, their employees or beneficiaries to go through that network. Um, the other thing is, I think the any willing buyer, again, 
uh, be becomes uh, relevant. So if Blue Cross and Blue Shield would come to us and say, we, you know, we want to utilize your service at those prices, and we said, well, as long as you send us the patients, we submit an invoice and, and you pay us, you know, we don't do copays, we don't do deductibles. No we'll haggling. Take, we'll take, we'll take, it ain't no. going to happen. No. But no. the point is, we would take, <laughs> we would take that payment. Missouri, Missouri does have a certificate of need. Uh, we've been able to get around it um, just based on what our costs were to construct everything. We have our own imaging between MRI um, and X-ray, ultrasounds um, as well. But the surgery center, we're able to kind of sneak around that a little bit. I, yes. I, have, I have a question about the two silos. <clears throat> Do you have different tax ID numbers? Yes. We don't. Yeah, <laughs> of we course, do. we don't. We have very little free market business as of yet. Uh, yeah, the certificate of need is one issue, but then there's this other issue in Obamacare that uh, prohibits uh, physician-owned facilities, uh, prohibits new ones from forming, and prohibits uh, existing ones from expansion. Um, I know that, uh, I believe that uh, Dr. Smith, if I'm not uh, uh, mistaken, avoids this by not taking Medicare and Medicaid by staying completely away from the government, and then that That's restriction right. does not apply. That's correct. Um, I find I find that just as a comment, I find that very curious that the hospital lobby got that thing put in Medicare under the uh, uh, excuse that physicians would self-refer, and now those same hospitals are buying up everything in sight, and I'm sure that they expect referrals to stay within that network. So this is kind of like crazy, but I was just wondering, for either one of you, um, uh, are you feel the pressure to dump Medicare and Medicaid and, and so that you're, you can expand and, and grow this thing? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I grew up in this area, so to me, there's a lot of people that remember when I, when I was four years old, and now that I'm replacing their knees. So I've not dumped Medicare a lot because of that reason, because my parents are still there, family's still there. Um, Medicaid, to me, I take care of a lot of athletes just because of the type of practice that we have. So there's a lot of kids that, you know, they're, they're uh, underserved families and uh, they've got Medicaid, so we take care of them. The problem I have with Medicaid is 50 miles south of me at the University of Missouri, the University Hospital has a contract with Medicaid that they're getting better than Blue Cross rates for the Medicaid patients that they take. And I got to take the chump change for Medicaid, and that ain't fair, 50 miles away. I'm not dumping stuff to them besides things I just can't technically take care of. I don't do spine. I don't want long bone trauma. So to me, I'm doing my part for the small percentage of Medicaid that I take care of. But in the end, is it, is it cost me money? Yes. It, to me, it's more of a community service that I want to give back to by keeping it in place. Yeah, and unfortunately, we're nowhere near in position to, to drop those programs, but that would I, be ideal. But to just tag on a little bit on the Medicaid, I, I think we could probably do it for free, not be involved in the Medicaid program at all, see very little loss of revenue, yeah. and still perform the community <laughs> service. What, uh, in Missouri, what percentage of uh, Medicare does Medicaid pay? Because different states vary. Do you, do you have an idea? Teresa. <laughs> I would say, gosh, it, it's probably somewhere in the range of, it, it's low. It's 30 percent. Uh, that, that is very low. Yep. In, in Oklahoma, we pay 82 percent, which is the Medicare rate, which is high. National average is 68. So in Oklahoma, we do a pretty good job of taking care of that. And some people might complain that that's high, but you're back to the cost shifting portion on government monies and taxes along with uh, certain other large entities being able to negotiate rates along with uh, the indigent care, which is a little overinflated for the most part because they report what their charges would be and if the hospital's charging 540 percent of Medicare then it looks pretty bad as an indigent rate when it's really not that much of an indigent loss rate but there's a lot of different factors going on with that but 
a Missouri, I would say probably in this, I would guess maybe in the 50 to 55 to 65 percent range, if I recall. And I think Texas is 52. So national average 68, we pay 82. So Oklahoma, and it was 87. They're kind of, they're claiming all the loss they did because they had to go down five percent due to some money taken out. So the doctors here, I don't think are treated as badly as other places, but probably wouldn't agree with that. I, I think at least in my practice, uh, you look at the demographics, probably about 15% right. of it I is should, I probably, should yeah, probably a high mark on Medicare as far as what we see, the number of patients. It, it was interesting when we costed it out at the hospital, we, we couldn't survive on a Medicaid population, but for the most part, Medicaid contributed to the margin when we did the procedures. Mm -hmm. Currently in Oklahoma, we just surpass more people on Medicaid than on employer-based plans. Is that right? Wow. Wow. I don't want to throw this because I'm going to knock over water. I got a feeling. <laughs> I, I think it's important to point out, since this is called the Free Market Medical Association, that we put Medicare pricing in the proper context. It is an illegitimate benchmark. It is the Rosemary's baby of Harvard University. <laughs> it, has no, yes. it has no foundation in reality at all. Um, real pricing emerges from competitive activity. It's never passed down top down. And I like the way Adam Russo, the FIA group, even refers to um, reference-based pricing. He calls it a gateway drug because it will take you to that poss possibly and hopefully that next step. But to talk about percentages of Medicare is, is weird because Medicare is all over the place. You could say, who's Medicare? In Oklahoma City, there are probably seven separate Medicare fee schedules depending on where you go. It's all over the place. The prices we have online at Surgery Center of Oklahoma are less than what Medicaid pays these so-called bankrupt not-for-profit hospitals for the same procedures. So I also say that because the amount of the fee that I have online that goes to the surgeon is more than he gets from anyone. So think about that as you realize the real price gougers in this industry are the institutions. They are these hospitals and when they say we're going broke because we're only being paid $38,000 for a cochlear implant surgery, keep in mind my price online for that's $8,500. <laughs> now we add to that the price of the implant, which varies, but which is around $24,000 now. But I came up with $32,500, and we are not doing this to go broke. We are making money that the hospitals at $38,000 are going broke because that's what Medicaid pays them. So I think it's very important before we accept Medicare, this Rosemary's baby of healthcare pricing that has done so much to destroy the practice of medicine in this country and to distort pricing. It's very important that we keep Medicare pricing in its proper context. We all know those hospitals are making money because they keep adding on. They're all getting bigger. I haven't seen a hospital yet around the St. Louis area that's not adding on some kind of tower. Uh, quick question. We heard an article about disintermediation a little bit. And um, in order to do away with government health care, you have to rearrange your entire cost structure to do it. And so I, just my personal observation is I think it would be difficult to do both and to be able to ever be successful in, in, in a free market because you're going to have to carry all the expenses that are required to meet all of the different government mandates. So what would be your plan, or do you have a plan, to be able to change your operating structure so you'd be able to do that? We're, we're already in a situation when we're, we're taking pay, payments from third-party payers that are less than what we're going to make in our, in our free market business. Um, and we're it's easy to look efficient when you compare you know, a private entity that has control over how you run things to a nonprofit. You know, our, our administrative costs are a fraction of what it is there. So I, 
I don't think it's going to be an, an issue. I really think what's going to happen is that as our free market business grows, we'll just start getting rid of our worst payer. And so I, I think it'll be self-sustaining. Obviously, over the years, you know, we'll, we'll need less administrative support in revenue cycle, in, you know, in pre-cert and all that. Uh, but for the time being, you know, the, the, the model is helping us. It's not, it's not hurting us. I just want to make a comment about this concept that I think a lot of physicians fall into the trap of when we say that we want to care for indigent patients, that we do that through, uh, say, for instance, participating in Medicaid. Now, I am a clinic-based, 100% clinic-based practice. I'm a rheumatologist. I just, I've opted out of Medicaid and Medicare, as it turns out. I've offered a fair cash price, and I will guarantee you that I see more Medica Medicaid patients because many of the rheumatologists in my own community do not accept Medicaid. And Medicaid, as we all know, they get their primary care through the emergency room. And I will also mention to you that Medicare is becoming the new Medicaid. I had a patient who was seeing me under Medicaid, Medicare patient seeing me under my fair cash pricing, who was very thankful, by the way, that I got her in, I handled the problem. It was a you know musculoskeletal issue. She started to relate to me that a few weeks earlier, she called her uh, doctor who takes her insurance, started telling her she needed to get in for whatever reason. They told her to go to the emergency room. At the same time, that same clinic practice was contacting her husband to try to get him in for his wellness visit. So it's a perverse incentive. You see, the wellness visit pays more. But if you want to try to get in for your, uh, you, if you're having an issue, you're going to be told as a Medicare patient to go to the ER. So my point to you is, if you offer a fair cash price, you're going to be guaranteeing that patient potentially access where they may not be getting it otherwise. So I guess we're wrapping it up. Th thanks very much. Thanks so much, guys. Appreciate it.